For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy, to ghostly phenomena in our own backyard, we will dive into our psychic abilities and explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Hey! All right, thank you, thank you. Welcome back to 30 Odd Minutes. We have missed you guys. Sorry for the hiatus, but life got crazy. Everybody just had a lot to do, and we're glad to be back. We have missed you. It's live, and if you are watching live at 30oddminutes.com, jump into our chat room because Sarah, Rob, and Oddbot3000, there they are. They are eagerly awaiting you. They will pass your questions up to our, our guest tonight. Uh, I've been really busy. I've been traveling a lot. I was in Cincinnati last weekend. This was pretty cool. I went to the Queen City Paracon, which was a, a great event in, in Cincinnati, at the Queen City Music Hall. This place was beautiful. Um, there I am, outside the Queen City Music Hall. They say it's haunted. We got to go around inside. Let's go in. It's so cool to be in these places after dark and see things that uh, only security staff often gets to see. Great event, great people, had a wonderful time. Thank you all, and uh, hopefully we'll do another one in the future. So uh, keep your emails coming to us. We did get a bunch while we were on hiatus. We got tweets and Twitters and, and all kinds of other stuff. Miss Sarah, what do, uh, what do our viewers want to know? <laughs> Okay, so we got one entitled 30 odd plus robots equals happy. I totally agree. It says, hey, I loved your show on cybernetics a few weeks ago. While I enjoyed every one of the odd minutes listening to Dr. Warwick's talk about his self-experimentation, how about checking out one of your own local experts on this side of the pond, such as the work of Dr. John Donahue of Brown University? I love the ghosts and all, but here's my vote for more robot and cyborg coverage. Oddity out. Wow, they like when we have PhDs. It's tough to get those guys, you know. They're uh, they're very smart and busy, and uh, actually, all of our guests tend to be pretty bright. So I don't know why they do our show, but God bless them. <laughs> Brown University. Brown, I don't know. I think they let Sarah in, and that's about it. Don't you work? <laughs> yeah, she works. Don't you work there? I could hook us up, man. Okay, oh, done. Hook us up. All right, very good. Okay, so tonight we're talking about a very big question: Where do we come from? I've asked my mom and dad; they won't tell me. So. We're going to put it to a, a, an expert tonight, and I'm, I'm really excited about this. This is something I've heard about for years. Uh, Matt Moniz, fellow oddball, and I were talking about it, and he said, oh, man, we've got to talk about the star child skull. And what a guest, what a subject we're going to cover tonight. You're going to see this thing. Could there be some genetic mixture between humans and another race? From where? We don't know. We can only speculate. Tonight's guest, Lloyd Pye, is a researcher and author who studies alternative theories to human origins on Earth. Back in 1999, he helped form the Star Child Project in order to research the roots of a most unusual skull discovered in Mexico. We'll tell you all about it in a second. Uh, it has a human mother and a father who may not be of this world. More on that. Uh, Pi has gone on to write multiple books, including The Star Child Skull, Genetic Enigma, or Human-Alien Hybrid. You've seen The Star Child Skull on the National Geographic Channel, BBC, Discovery, History Channel, TLC, a ton of other places. Tonight, the Skull and Lloyd Pye are all yours, live from the Florida Panhandle. Please put your hands together for Lloyd Pye. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Lloyd. Right. Right. Well, thank you for that, Jeff. Quite an introduction, and uh, I'm very glad to be here with you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Lloyd, let me bring our, our viewers up to speed on the backstory, and we'll talk about that, too. But uh, this, is, this is how this, this skull is found. Uh, it goes back to the 1930s. An El Paso, Texas girl and her family were vacationing about 100 miles southwest of Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, near Copper Canyon, the Copper Canyon region. We can bring up a map and show you. See that red dotish somewhere around there? Uh, the girl goes off on her own and finds a skull inside of a cave. She also sees another bone, does some digging, finds two skeletons, uh, brings them back as a souvenir. Uh, the story goes that uh, a, a, a flood came through. Most of the bones were lost. The two skulls make it back to San Antonio show up again in the 1990s, specifically 1998, when they come into the possession of Ray and Melanie Young, who then seek out our guest tonight, Lloyd Pye, to help research this thing. In 99, they start the Star Child Project because this thing seems odd. Am I right? What did you think, Lloyd, when you first held this skull? Well, when I first held it, I, I knew something was very wrong about it, but I couldn't imagine that it would be, um, as you can see if, if you're able to... Yeah see it on camera uh 
you can see it looks very different from a typical human skull. Maybe that's maybe that's too close. <laughs> but uh, it, my first reaction was that the eye sockets. I knew a little about eye sockets. My dad had been an optometrist, so that caught my eye first. No pun intended. And I then felt the rest of it. I felt the weight of it, and I knew pretty much what Melanie knew, which was that it it wasn't really very much like a human just to look at it but even so at that time i couldn't believe it would be anything other than a deformity of some kind although i had to concede that there was the possibility that it would be something else and i needed all of 99 to convince myself to talk to enough specialists who would give me enough insight about the various differences in it to convince myself that yeah this probably really is not entirely human and then it became a quest for the dna once we had enough physiological differences and and really when you look at it when you look at a human to compare and then you look at the star child behind it or beside it right uh, well actually we can bring up a photo here um we can bring up a photo here showing the two skulls side by side let's take a look at that the the uh, bottom line is when you when you see the two there you go there's not a single exact corollary in the star child to a human every single part of it that's every every part of it important or not important is different and some pieces are are not there some parts are not there in the star child so significantly different but uh scientists would always say no matter what we proved in terms of physiological differences they would say nature can do anything you you cannot throw anything at us that we can't say nature can do anything and and you're left holding the bag here the all we'll respect is dna so we began the search for dna we got a test in 99 that was very very um uh unlikely to do what we needed to do but we had to do something it was a forensic test it wasn't for uh ancient dna which is over 50 years and the star child is indeed 900 years old so we just didn't have what we needed by the way uh, there's no e on the end of my name oh jeez i'm sorry it's just lloyd it's okay no problem Ah. just for people who go to look me up, uh, that that won't show. But anyway, um, so the the first test in '99 didn't work out for us. Now science still insists that we are bound to go by that initial result, which was that the star child was a human, and that was it. And we should have packed up and gone home in '99. And we've since proved twice now that that test was completely wrong. But science and, and on Wikipedia and other places still insists that because it was once labeled as human, it is for all time a human, even though that test has been completely proved wrong. In 203, the te- test that did that, that proved that it was wrong, in 203 showed that the mother, as you said earlier, the mother was human, no question about it, because the star child's mitochondrial DNA is human. There are two kinds of DNA that come. There's there's mitochondrial, which floats outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm of your cells, and then inside the nucleus is the the nuclear dna and that is the whole genome that's all three billion base pairs the mitochondrial dna they're little chips of sixteen thousand base pairs long so when when the uh nuclear dna was tested when the uh geneticists went to do that they couldn't find the star child's uh nuclear dna and so the answer was simple mother's human father's something's really wrong with him father's really not human if he was human we could recover it because we can't recover it we can't prove what he is so all we're going to be able to say is that we can't recover your new you know the star child's nuclear dna right you're going to have to wait three to five years for a new test to come online that will that will allow the recovery of the entire genome, whatever it is. And so we know that uh, genetic testing has come a long way. DNA, we've cracked in the last 10 years, it's come miles. I mean, we've we've cracked the the human genome. We know so much more than we did uh, since the 1990s. But let's talk about some of the tests. I mean, you went through the radiocarbon dating, like you you said, that said this thing is 900 years old, give or take 40 years. Uh, You did CAT scans, you did x-rays. And, and now we're up to a series of DNA, t- DNA tests. Uh, Andy, in the back, maybe we could bring up some of these x-rays just to show. I think it really um, enunciates. Oops, different one. <laughs> that's okay, but that's actually good, too. So this is the comparison between this and normal and right. abnormal skulls. This is, this is one, um, 
you know, one comparison. But if you look at this x-ray between the two skulls found next to each other, there you go. I mean, just look at the shape of the head. That's a profile. Um, you know, it, it's obviously radically different um, than, than this human skull. Now, some of the findings, um, this, this female skull was not the genetic mother of the star child, correct? That's what was proved in 203, exactly, through, the, through her mitochondrial DNA, which was haplogroup A, and the star child's mitochondrial DNA, which for, was from haplogroup C, we know that they were not genetically related. So, we, and we thought they were up to that point. We assumed that it was its mother uh, that had died with it. So that was a surprise for us. But the, the real surprise was that we couldn't recover the nuclear DNA knowing that it was there. It, it, for the human, it had come up very clear on the first attempt, both mitochondrial and nuclear, very clear. And on the star child, first attempt, very clear mitochondrial. So we know it's there. Science will say that because we couldn't recover, that means there had to be some kind of exotic degradation. But it isn't. It, it just isn't. That's just an excuse they use to keep from having to deal with it. But the truth of it is, the, the nuclear DNA was good. It just wouldn't respond to human-only primers because part of it isn't human. Right. But we couldn't prove that. So we've needed to wait since 203, seven years, until early this year, just a couple months ago, really. A geneticist uh, contacted me, and he said, look, I using the techniques that we have now, I can shotgun this thing. I can catch little small pieces of it, 200, 300, 400 base pairs long, and we'll, I can tell you if the nuclear DNA is there. And that's really what you need to know in order to get an investor to come forward who will be willing to, to pay for the testing. And I said, it's exactly right, exactly right. If you can just recover the nuclear DNA and prove that it's there, any part of it, then we'll be able to move ahead. Okay, fine. So he takes a sample, and about three weeks later, he sends me an email, and it says this. Hang on, Dorothy. We're not in Kansas anymore. Uh -huh. That's good. And that, the right away, that told us what he had. And so gave him a call, and we talked about it, and he said that, sure enough, he had recovered the nuclear DNA, and it was there, and it was human. It, it, part of it had come out of the first chromosome. And, but the way he, he did that is the way all geneticists do now. They compare it against the NIH database, the National Institute of Health database, which has over 120 animal species types in it not just animals, uh, animal species, but species types, so that you've got pretty much everything there from viruses, bacteria, mollusks, crustaceans, up to you know, invertebrates, uh, vertebrates, primates, right on through. Everything's there. So um, he found that not only did you have human, but you had a goodly amount of store that we found in the AH debase, meaning not found on Earth. So he said, you know, you've got something here that's considerably more than we imagined, that I imagined. You're going to need a much, you know, this is a much bigger deal. Right. And I said, well, you're right. It is a much bigger deal. So uh, we're now in the process of getting the money to do a very comprehensive recovery of the entire genome. But the analysis now is what's going to be the big story. Not so much recovering the whole thing, but analyzing what is recovered because so much of it is going to be unknown or not seen before, or how do you put it in context? How do you compare it to human, chimp, gorilla, Neanderthal? Uh, there's a lot of work to do now with that. Right. And we, of course, have to make a documentary film about the whole process. So it's, it's really a big deal now. We're very excited. We're confident we're going to be able to carry it through and get it done. And so really, it's, it's history in the making, and, and here we are. And one of the things, too, I mean, if I could go back to my high school biology, which is about as far as I got in my uh, medical studies, uh, there's a reason that certain animals can't breed with other animals. You have to be genetically close, really, really close, in order to, to you know, successfully breed. One of the examples, uh, Lloyd, you and I talked about earlier was the mule, you know, where you've got, a, uh, right. you know, you've got a female horse and a male donkey that creates a mule that's almost always sterile. They're close genetically and can, and can successfully, you know, crossbreed. But a human to successfully crossbreed, uh, you know, you, you think you'd be looking pretty close. But what you found so far is that this star child, the, the nuclear DNA, is not that close of a match to human, correct? 
Right. It's so far away that the, the about the only way we can conceive of the star child at this point being being created using human DNA is that it's not a sex from a sexual union. It's from genetic engineering. Like in the same way that right now we are genetically engineering children whose mothers have mitochondrial disease, where their mi mitochondrial DNA is is flawed, and it's going to create horrible affliction, afflictions for them. Right. So what you for that woman to have a child, you have to take her uh, her gamete, the, the the part of her that is just the her, the nuclear part of her, her 23 chromosomes, mix it with a sperm and put it in with an egg that has good mitochondrial DNA. So you're creating children with three parts of three parents, parts of three human beings. We're already doing that. Right. So this is essentially what we're talking about in terms of the star child based on where we are right now with this very early, these first few runs, these first few samples. It's looking like we will be able to prove that it was not created from sexual union and and of course that's not just making history that's making incredible history because it means there was genetic engineering going on at least 900 years ago and you know that's certainly there's going to be no way that they can say this is a bizarre human you know it's right it's going to be a lot more than that yeah and that i mean that's the breaking news right i mean genetic engineering 900 years ago we just right. you know i mean if we were talking thousands of years ago we could speculate about civilizations rising and falling but when you're talking about 900 years, that's just not that long, historically speaking. Okay, right. Lloyd, uh, stay with us one second. We have to take a quick break for a field report from one of our oddball fans. Let's get to it. Hi, this is Chris York. And I'm Greg Ewan. And we're from Rain City Paranormal. We're currently downstairs at the Old Wheeler Hotel. And uh, before it was actually the Old Wheeler Hotel, it was a, uh, a place called the Reinhardt Clinic, which specialized in arthritis. Um, and then before that, it was actually a old bordello. This is our 30 odd minutes field report. And we're going to go ahead and let Katie um, tell you some of the stories that she told us last night. And one of my first experiences in this building is down here by myself. And I went, you know, I'm feeling around and I'm walking through in the dark. And something physically stopped me from going in this space. And it's an elevator shaft, it is a hole with water and it was full of water and I had somebody tell me Julia was a prostitute that the her client got a little rough with her and killed her and then he threw her down the, the shaft and that's who and I didn't tell anybody that story mm -hmm. and so she's there protecting everybody from that shaft the <laughs> well done oh my goodness wow i mean is that the best video production we've ever had on this show ever. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. that was okay man they make us look bad thank you very much for sending that in chris that was great uh rain city paranormal uh the folks over there sent that in we love it well done sir well done okay if you want to send in your field reports email us at info at 30 odd you can go to our website and find out uh, more about the criteria, but we want to hear from you from wherever you are. Send it from all over the world. All right, we're talking about human origin, maybe. We're talking about deviations, leaps in evolution, great mysteries that come up every now and then when you find an artifact. So many aspects of the paranormal occur where, you know, it's just stories, and stories are wonderful, and we share them with each other, but when you've got something you can hold and test, that's when it gets good. That's when we love it. Uh, Lloyd, we do have a question for you from our chat room. Rob, do tell. Hey, Jeff, you're my daddy. Ah, uh, you know. No, just kidding. We have a question from Bri Pie from Down Under, Australia. All right, Australia. He All just, right. he wants to know if there have been similar skulls found around the world. Did you catch that, Lloyd? Have, have they found similar yes, skulls? Yes, I did. Similar skulls around the world, no. Nothing like the star child ever that I'm aware of. I get most of, I'm sure, the photos and, and stories that are out there. However, there's another whole set of skulls that are known as the conehead skulls, the ones that are found dominantly in Peru but in other parts of the world, and they are the ones that have human-like faces but heads that go back and, and their heads are twice the size of ours. Uh, I think the coneheads, if anyone were to do DNA on them, 
would show out that they're not entirely human as well. I do not see how you can have a human brain, I mean, a, a brain twice the size of a human brain consistently in head after head after head after head and have those beings be humans. I, I just, I think there's something else. Maybe part human, but maybe more like the donkey that uh, we, I mean, the mule that we were talking about. But nonetheless, I don't think that the coneheads are going to prove out to be 100% human. But as far as I know, I've been saying this now for 10 years, and I, as far as I know, no one's ever bothered to do even a fundamental, simple DNA test on a, on a conehead skull. Or if they have, they haven't announced it. And that may be the truth, the, the truth of it. They've done it, they've seen what the result was, and they just chose not to reveal it. Do you think some of these things uh, scare mainstream scientists, that, that it doesn't fall into what, how we know the, the world works or evolution works, and, and they just kind of run away? Or is it... Uh, are there some that are brave enough to come forward? I just, yeah, that's it exactly. I don't think they're scared. I think they're terrified. I think they're horrified. Just try to imagine the changes that proving alien reality to a point where you just can't argue with it. Landing on the White House lawn, for example. Think of the changes that that will create in the society, much less in the world of science. But this, you know, what we're talking about now is running science through with its own sword, which is basically DNA. I mean, DNA is the math of biology. It's very, very hard to argue with that. So if we can produce our result again and again and again such that with enough redundancy, you know they're going to argue the first time out. You know they're going to argue the second time out, maybe even the third time. But there comes a point where you've done it enough, you've shown it enough, and even the, the most diehard, fanatical, don't want to change scientists are just going to have to get on board and accept it, like it or not. And so is your speculation that this is from extraterrestrial DNA that we're looking at? I don't really see how it can be anything else. I really don't. I don't. There's no way they're going to be able to say it's some kind of unusual human. You know how with the Hobbit. I mean, you've got a creature in the Hobbit without a single human bone in its body. Again, not a single human corollary in a part or parcel of that being is human. And everybody knows it except scientists who say, well, it, it has to be some other kind of human because we can't allow for the possibility of hominoids. Hominoids being Bigfoot, the abominable snowman and all that. Most people aren't aware that there is a pygmy type of hominoid known around, you know, across, around the equator, around the Earth's equator belt in the jungles. And, and everywhere says the same thing. There are these little pygmy-like hair-covered um, beings that walk upright, uh, and, and they have one right on that island of Flores. Science, you know, just won't allow that in, into the game. So they say it's just some kind of weird human. Well, we have to live with that until we just prove them wrong. We know they're wrong, but we have to prove them wrong because they require us to you know the thing about extraordinary climate extraordinary proof and so we're stuck with that very high standard reaching that very high standard of proof but we will get it done and it's certainly in the case of the star child and eventually in the case of hominoids we're going to show like one of the other books uh, that i wrote that that you didn't mention but it's called everything you know is wrong literally everything of the main big chunks of knowledge that scientists professes to have nowadays i believe all that's going to be proved out to be wrong over time excellent matt uh, Matt Moniz, our own uh, oddball here. You've handled this skull. Um, well, I've handled the the, the, uh, the, right. the copy. The, the copy of it. The copy, right. the copy right. yeah. This, uh, when you met Lloyd and, uh, and Roswell, right. Yep. And so what did you think when you held it, when you looked at it? Uh, luckily, the original skull was in a glass casement right next to it, so I was able to compare actually both of them within feet of each other. And um, I found that the Star Child skull is extremely unique. Now, um, I'm a chemist by trade, not, not a biologist, but I've had you know, several biology classes and stuff like that. And I found that the, this skull definitely shows the human characteristics, but the way it's shaped, the morphology of it, is definitely different. I think Lloyd's hit on a very good point here that the DNA, the nuclear DNA that they got from this will show that the reason why it's different is because it has been engineered to be so. Right, and one of the things too, we actually have another image to bring up, uh, Andy, number seven. It's, uh, it's a comparison between the, the density of the star child uh, skull and that of a human skull, and you can see, uh, you can see the difference there. 
I only have six. All right. Well, you're you talking about the little fibrils. We're talking about the fibril. That's okay. Well, we'll, we'll uh, have links to Lloyd's website on our site, and you can check those out. It's um, you know, there's there's so much to see. There's so much to read. But as as far as um, but 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 the point is that this skull is dense and twice as thin. Am I correct, Lloyd? It's half as yes. It's half as thick as a normal human bone. Weighs half as much, and it's two or three times as hard because its its physical chemistry has been changed to be more like tooth enamel than bone. It's much harder than bone. Considering we've uh, you've only one of these skulls has turned up so far, is it fair to call this kind of a mistake? I mean, uh, if it was a genetic test, they probably didn't do another one. Is that fair to speculate? Did we lose you? Yeah. Oops, sorry. Uh, Unfortunately, Jeff, you broke up there so badly I could not no, understand your question. I'm no sorry. problem. No, uh, what I was saying is that it seems since there's only one of these that's turned up, would this be considered a, a, a failure as, as an experiment, uh, considering we, don't, we haven't found dozens of these things? Well, I don't think you get an experiment that comes out so absolutely perfectly symmetrical as this thing is. I right. mean, it's more symmetrical in its own way than a typical human skull. It's more symmetrical than the human skull that was found with it. I mean, it is staggeringly precise on both sides of its of its face, of its of its head. Uh, I don't think that's an experiment. It, it Everything about it comes out different, and yet it comes out working perfectly enough to live, certainly into adulthood. I don't see that as an experiment. And besides, if it is an experiment, who is the experimenter, or right. who are the experimenters? Right, and you know, let's also talk about when you look at a long lineage of, of humanoids that have been found, uh, you know, fossil records, things like that, uh, from early Homo sapiens on through. You do see some variations in skull and shape and things like that. Uh, but are, are we looking for a leap? I mean, do you think this is uh, this is the start of something? I mean, 900 years ago, will it come back? I mean, I know we're speculating now, but. Yeah, we're, we're speculating, and I don't really think so. I think probably uh, we all know, know the story of the women. There are many women out there who claim that they are taken on board a UFO. They are made pregnant. They go to a doctor. He tells them they're pregnant. They get a sonogram. They, they are pregnant. And right. in the fourth month, uh, it, it's, they're taken on board, or, or it's taken away. The, their fetus is taken away. They have every sign of a miscarriage and, you know, no fetus. So, and then later, five years, six years, seven years, eight years, ten years later, they're taken on board. They're shown a child, and they're told, this is your child. And they believe it. And, and if you talk to Whitley Strieber, that happens to men as well. So um, if that program has been going on, if it's going on now, who's to say it wasn't going on 900 years ago and that the star child is one of those beings that got away, you know, that normally they come and pick them up and take them away. Somehow it got away. It died early. Something happened, but it isn't a child. That was what we thought at first, but it isn't a child. It's an adult, but maybe it was an adult. Maybe it crash landed here. Uh, who knows what? Right. We're all, we are speculating. What, what we're trying to do is just stay focused on what we can prove, and what we can prove is genetically it's not a human being. We're very confident of that at this point, and so that's what we're going to carry through doing, and after that, the fallout will just have to take care of itself. Right, and so let's talk about what's next in terms of the testing. Uh, you mentioned that there was tests recently. You're getting good nuclear DNA, so, so what's next for the star child? We just get the money that we need now to do the big testing. Um, we're looking at a million and a half to two million to do it all and then do a documentary film at the same time, and that's another million or two. So we're looking at uh, around a $5 million package total. But at the, this now we're instead of building just a Volkswagen, we're building a Rolls Royce. We're right. going to try to produce the very best testing and example that we can. The oh. end is near. Okay. <laughs> yes. I love that. That's, that's I love warning. that. That's, that's our warning. Great. Yeah. <laughs> great way to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Well, you know, this. what's great, as I said earlier, is, is sometimes evidence turns up like this, and it forces us to ask big questions, to question where we came from. Uh, you know, are, are we ourselves some kind of, you know, millions of years ago, some kind of hybrid between something that was here and something from, you know, somewhere else? That's what I, I love about all this stuff. I think that I think we are that, and I think that's going to prove out to be around 200,000 years ago. Excellent stuff, Lloyd. Please keep us informed. We are right up uh, out of time, but I appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you sharing your photos and your research with us, folks. Until next time, please stay odd. Yeah. yeah.